the MCAT Cars Podcast, session number 39. The car section of the MCAT gives thousands of pre-meds nightmares every night. Whether you're an ESL student, lack confidence while reading, or a slow reader like me, Jack Weston and the medical school headquarters are here to help you score higher in every section so you can be confident you're ready to get the MCAT score of your dreams. Welcome to the MCAT Cars Podcast. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray, and as always, I'm here today with Jack Weston from jackweston.com to help you with your MCAT Cars score. And when you improve your MCAT car score with what we teach in this podcast, what Jack teaches in his course, you will improve every section of the MCAT. So this week, we are going over another great passage, going through it to really help you improve how you are going to break down your passages on the MCAT. Jack Weston, how you doing today? Good. How are you, Ryan? I'm good. I'm excited for another passage of reading and cars and breaking down. Last week, we had a fun one about airplanes having my private pilot. That was fun for me to to uh, read and being involved and trying to stay up to date with what's going on with that Boeing trial and everything. Uh, this week looks like another fun one. What do we have in store this week? Uh, pretty straightforward passage. Uh, just a lot of details. If you're not interested in this material, then it's kind of it's going to be harder to read. But I'm assuming that uh, you know, if you're into pop culture or into comics and stuff, you're probably not going to have a hard time with it. When a student comes across when they're doing their, their full length exams or while they're sitting there on their real test day at the testing center and they're like, oh, like I have no interest in this. What, what should they tell themselves to, to feign interest or to just kind of get their mind back in the game? You can't have that moment. You just can't. You you can't tell yourself I'm not interested in this, right? You have to, you have to, you have to at least pretend that you're interested, mm-hmm. right? And I, th- I, I tell students this all the time: try to find interest in anything you read, right? There, there should be no article that you look at and go, "Oh, I don't want to read this," because if you have that sense, you're gonna mess up on some of these articles. You're gonna just, yeah. you're not gonna read them. You're not gonna do well on them. So. Mm-hmm. You know, my my perspective on this is, look, this is an author, right? Someone wrote this article, right? There are nine articles, so there are nine authors. Usually they're different authors. Listen to them. This is your only opportunity to listen to them or else you'll never hear their point of view mm. about this topic ever again. And that's what I love about cars because, you know, in some ways you don't have to go in knowing anything, but in other ways you have to go in embracing everything, right? So yeah. you don't have to come in with any knowledge, but you have to come in with this, this, this kind of attitude that, hey, I'm going to accept whatever knowledge they give me and I'm going to listen to this, right? So it's, it's very different than, let's say, your bio class where you're interested in, you know, understanding how the heart works, right? Or how, I don't know, uh, mitosis and meiosis works, <laughs> right? But, what, you know, when you come into this, you know nothing about the topic probably, right? You know nothing about the author or their perspective on this topic. So you have to kind of change your attitude completely, 180. I mean, you have to you have to be a totally different person when you read these articles. Hopefully, you don't have to be a totally different person. Hopefully, you as an individual like reading these things. Mm. Um, and that's what I find uh, with most students who do well. They're just willing to read it and understand it. They're listening to other people's perspectives. They don't zone out. And if you tend to zone out, that's not your problem. That just happens. So get back mm-hmm. into it, right? But if, you, if you're telling yourself, oh yeah, this is hard. I don't want to read this. I don't want, you know, this is boring. I don't want to read this. You're, you're already messing up. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're not gonna, like there are people there, that are getting 130s, 131s who do not think that way. Who are going and going, oh, let me read about this. Or, oh, mm-hmm. let me read about that. Oh, that's interesting. So find interest in whatever you read. This is the only opportunity you have to read about this topic from this author, why not listen to it? Yeah, I, I think that that negative self-talk, whether you, you consider that negative or not of, oh, I'm not interested in this topic or more of a negative would be, oh, I'm, I'm really bad at these types of passages or for ESL students as they're reading, like, I don't understand anything that's going on. I'm terrible at English. 
um, all of that stuff is just taking up your processing power to, to do well on the test. Confidence, confidence and endurance, right? Yeah. So have confidence in yourself. Uh, just because you're not an avid reader does not mean that you can't read these passages in, in a timely manner. Mm-hmm. You can build that through practice. You have to have the endurance. So you have to build that endurance through practice, like, you know, anything else you do. And you can do, I think a lot of students go in thinking, oh yeah, well, I can, I can do this test. You know, I just have to take the test on the day of, that's not how it works. Yeah. It's, it, it's a marathon. You, you gotta, you have to really prepare yourself and, um, you're not going to do that in one day or even one week. You got to do it over a couple of weeks or, you know, maybe even a couple of months. So, you know, prepare yourself. That's why they call this preparation, right? Test preparation. You have to prepare for this exam. And if you go in without that sense of, oh, I, I can get better, I can improve. Um, and you think that, you know, inherently you'll never improve, you're, you're bound to mess up. Yeah. Okay. Right. But yeah, so just find interest in what you're reading, embrace the fact that you're going to get better over time and, you know, try to keep an open uh, a mind about what you're reading. You might learn something new. Like today, we're going to probably read something that you may not know anything about, or maybe you do know about the topic, but they're going to bring up an element about the topic that you may not have thought about before. Mm. So that's interesting. Okay. All right. First paragraph. Earlier this month, Marvel Studios announced that the premiere of Avengers Endgame would be preceded by marathon screenings of all of the movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or MCU. All right. Ooh, so comic stuff. Avengers, Marvel Studios. I like this kind of stuff, so I'm, I'm excited already. Um, so nothing really groundbreaking here, just that we have a movie coming out and we're going to have screenings of all of the movies before. Sounds good. Yeah, and this is pretty easy to read, right? For yep. most students. Oh, Marvel Studios, Spider-Man. I think, I don't know. I think DC is <laughs> Superman, right? But what, yes. whatever, whatever <laughs> it is, right? So, you know, you just know it's about comic. And, um, you know, they're talking about some marathon screening. Um, yeah, sounds good. So we're, we're talking about all these movies, watching all these movies at once. All right. And, and for all of you, Marvel DC, uh, fanatics send all your hate mail to Jack. <laughs> all right. Um, since the MCU consists to date of 22 movies, the screenings were 59 hours and seven minutes long. Okay. So just, a kind of a stat, 22 movies and 59 hours. They topped the 31 hour, 31 hour screenings held last year before the premiere of Avengers Infinity War and the 29 hour screenings held in 2015 before the release of Avengers Age of Ultron. So it looks like um, this is something that Marvel does over and over again. They hold screenings uh, of all of their movies before the next release. Um, And it's just getting longer and longer and longer. I mean, yeah. How many movies do they release in a year? Like four or five of them now? <laughs> a lot. Like, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Okay. An MCU marathon is equal parts dare, endurance test, and assertion of fan dominance. The reporter Alex Abad Santos wrote at Vox after a pre-Ultra screening or Ultron screening. Um, all right. So we're, we're given a name here, reporter. Uh, who's basically saying these marathons are um, fan dominance, uh, endurance test, and, and part dare. Uh, so the he, I guess he's referring to the people who go to these screenings. Right. I mean, it, not only does it show how, how long you can stay and watch movies all day, right? Endurance test. But it can also show the impact of these movies, right? The mm-hmm. fact that these movies are very popular and, and, and high achieving movies. Yeah. Alex McLevy, a writer and editor at the AV club described the event he attended as beyond anything I have ever experienced in a movie theater. It's beautiful and terrifying. <laughs> um, all right. So another name, another writer, um, basically saying it's a, uh, it's, Beautiful and terrifying event. Right now, a lot of students may read terrifying and go, wait a second, that's bad, terrifying, right? It's not really said in a negative way, Mm -hmm. right? It's terrifying in the fact that it's surprisingly amazing. You know, it's like surprisingly like, like terrifying in the sense that like you can see how many people love these movies and you can see 
how you know m- many people are willing to stick around and watch these movies all day right mm-hmm. so that's that's what it means by saying it's terrifying it's not really scary or bad yeah okay all right next paragraph when iron man came out in 2018 it was a standalone film all right so just an, another marvel movie um given a, a time frame here 2018 so over a decade ago now it's crazy great movie i remember that um all right standalone film moviegoers didn't know what it would kick off or moviegoers didn't know that it would kick off a titanic interconnected narrative that during the next decade would include aliens thrashing new york city the avengers a space jailbreak guardians of the galaxy a terminator style robot insurrection avengers age of ultron a civil war captain america civil war and an apocalypse thor ragnarok all right so then the the author here is basically saying hey this this one movie when people saw it they didn't know what was coming next and then listed a bunch of examples here right so when i'm reading this i could care less about this stuff right avengers captain america but there are some students who love this stuff right yep so it's easy for them to pay attention and go oh yeah i remember thor i remember avengers and they they make sense out of it I don't care. It, it doesn't matter if you like it or you don't like it. Respect the author. Pay attention to what they're saying, right? They're just bringing up a lot of different movies with a lot of different narratives, a lot of different storylines. And, uh, you know, you just have to know that one movie, Iron Man, kind of brought about all these different other movies, right? Now, mm-hmm. if you know the exact details about Avengers, great, but you're not going to get more points because you know what happened in the movie, right? That doesn't really make a difference. But you will get points if you realize that the author is talking about how these movies have grown, how we have many of these movies, how they're very, very big, right? And very, very famous. Okay. Okay. Although the subtitle of the newest film, Endgame, suggests a conclusion, there are more movies on the horizon, including Spider-Man Far From Home, sequels to Black Panther and Doctor Strange, and a third installment of Guardians of the Galaxy. All right, so just more examples of of movies coming. Last month, Disney paid $71 billion for 21st Century Fox's entertainment business, ensuring that Marvel characters previously owned by Fox, including Deadpool, the X-Men, and the Fantastic Four, could appear in future editions to the MCU. All right, so now we're given more characters. We're given... um, this purchase of 21st Century Fox. Uh, I, as I'm reading this, I'm like, I hope that's not important, uh, but we'll just, we'll, we'll read it and move on. Yeah, you should understand it, right? Disney bought this other kind of movie company, yep. right? Uh, entertainment business for $71 billion. That's a lot of money, you yeah. know? And, um, and yeah, so you should just realize that they're trying to connect more of these superheroes and and movies together i want a deadpool land at disneyland i think that would be fun like an adult only 2021 and up deadpool land (laughs) oh but you haven't seen deadpool have you i've seen the first one i haven't seen okay all right you've you've saved yourself yeah Uh, i like you know x-men too i like x-men i don't mind that one fantastic four i I, didn't they come out with the newer one of that yeah different characters Yep. Did it do? I don't think it did that well. So I didn't. I didn't watch that one. Yep. Um. I've heard great things about Black Panther, Doctor Strange. I should. I mean, I should watch these movies. I don't know. Like, uh, Civil. Yeah. Like you know, some of these movies are, are sound great. Like I remember when Spider Man came out, like the very first one with Tobey Maguire. That was great. You yeah. Know? And then they they came out with all these other ones. And so I, I, I will tell you right now, go see Into the Spider Verse or Spidey Verse. Uh, the newest, uh, not the newest, newest one, because we just had this this new one, Far From Home, but the animated one that came out like last year in 2018. Right. Probably the best Spider-Man movie. It's awesome. Yeah, it's it on out. Netflix. Yeah, I love Spider-Man. It's on Netflix right now. Go watch it. All right. <laughs> um, and so just just to kind of make a note here for the the student who's like, I haven't seen any of these movies. If examples like this come up in a passage, they, they're not going to have to know anything other than what is being written, right? They're not going to go, the, 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 the question isn't going to go, well, according to the plot of the Avengers, blah, 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 right? They don't have to know any of that no. stuff. No, 
No, they're not going to ask about, oh, yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy. That was about a space jailbreak. No. But you should understand that a space jailbreak is a narrative, right? That they're talking about different kinds of stories within these movies, Mm -hmm. different kinds of plots in these movies, and how there are so many different plots and so many different movies. That's what matters, not the actual specifics of the plot. Yeah. And so it's funny, I was working on my application book and, and kind of breaking down the MCATs as, as part of it. And for the car section, the AAMC says about 40% of the, the car section is reasoning beyond the text. But, but knowing right, the plots of these things isn't reasoning beyond the text, right? No, yeah. no. Reasoning beyond the text uh, basically means what is the trend? That, yeah. That's what it means. So basically, they'll, they might introduce a whole new series, like a, qu- a question that might say, oh, imagine that there was another uh, enterprise where there were so many different uh, books and all the books had different storylines. So notice I'm, I'm, I'm bringing in an element we never really introduced before, books, right? We were, talking, we were talking about movies here. So the question will bring up something totally new, like books. And how there's so many different narratives, and then the author will, and the question will say, "What can we, what can we assume about these books, or what can we suggest about these books?" And what we can suggest is probably something along the lines of what we're talking about with the passage and the movies, right? So that's kind of reasoning beyond the text, using what you you found in the text for new scenarios, new situations, okay. but not specifically knowing the details of of the of the actual text that you're reading. That's not, they don't care about that. They're, they're again, focused on the bigger picture. Okay. All right, next paragraph. Though some fans complain about substandard movies and ever-lengthening runtimes, audiences remain invested in the MCU. Avengers Infinity War was the fourth highest grossing movie of all time, closely followed in the top 10 by The Avengers, Avengers Age of Ultron, and Black Panther. Right, so the author is saying, hey, some people are out there complaining, but the movies are still doing very well. Yeah, I mean, just notice that the author is saying there's some kind of complaints, but yes, exactly, they're still popular. Okay. It seems likely, in other words, that the MCU will continue to expand for the foreseeable future. <laughs> so the author is basically saying, as long as the movies are making money, they're going to keep making them. Right. This raises questions both super heroic and narratological. Ooh, um, I have no idea what those two words mean, but uh, we'll keep reading and hope, hope it's okay. Right. Go ahead. Will half of all the people on Earth who were snuffed out at the end of Infinity War, sorry, spoiler alert, ever be resurrected? Um, all right. So I guess the the narratological is is more like uh, what's what's happening in the movies, right? The questions, what's happening in the movies. So, uh, yeah, and don't don't worry, you don't have to know exactly what happened at the end of these movies, right? But you should know that it's posing a question about its narrative, mm-hmm. right? What's going to happen in this in this story if you're going to keep making movies about it? Yeah, and can the MCU really keep expanding? Um, all right, so just more questions. How flexible is a story, ultimately? Ooh. All right, so there's some rhetorical questions here by the author, really trying to dive in. If, if they're going to keep making movies, can you really keep expanding? How flexible are the stories if you need to change them, etc.? Can it be extended indefinitely without becoming meaningless, or will it reach some natural limit? How infinite can a fictional world be? All right. So lots of questions that the author is bringing up uh, because basically these movies are doing well. It seems like they're going to keep being made, but how far can you go? Right. I mean, that, that, like, think about it. You know, like there's so many of these movies and so many of these stories. Like, are they going to keep making stories over and over again about this stuff? Yeah. You know, will there ever be an end? I, I doubt it. Yeah. I highly doubt it. I it's mean, like they even brought the, back Star the Wars. The fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the uh, Spider-Man <laughs> actor coming in. <laughs> We're going to reboot yeah. it again. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it basically becomes kind of a, uh, a series, you know, like yep. uh, you have, you have, you know, season one, season two. I mean, what's the difference, you know, between these movies, really? 
yeah. just storylines are are changing, but the same character, same action, same stuff, right? Overall. Yeah. Okay. Next paragraph. By most accounts, Aristotle laid out the ground rules of storytelling in the fourth century BC in his Poetics. Ooh, interesting. All right. So fourth century BC, Aristotle and his work Poetics. We don't know really know what he did, but it, the author is saying that that apparently Aristotle has ground rules. Right. So he made some rules for storytelling. Yep. Okay. He argued that plot was at the core of narrative. A plot, he thought, needed to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Reflect an ordered structure of connected actions and be self-contained. All right. So now we, we have Aristotle's definition of a plot. The most effective plots, he wrote, should have a certain length, and this should be such as can readily be held in memory. Interesting. Um, so he, Aristotle's arguing that basically the plot can only be as long as we can remember. And, and it's funny because we're, we're kind of butting up against that, right? We have all of these movies and it's like, well, do I need to go back and watch them all again to remember what's happening? Right. Uh, before I re watch right. the next that's one. That's why we have these marathons, right? Exactly. So, um, yeah, so I mean, that is important, knowing that the plot should be a certain length, but I think you missed the bigger point, right? And that's the fact that you need a plot in a narrative, right? Mm. Forget the fact that the plots need to be a certain length. That's great and all, but we need a plot. That's the key to this, to this point, right? That the author, that Aristotle's making. We need plots for narratives. We need plots for storytelling. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Poetics has proved persuasive. Many narrative theorists see an orderly, coherent, and contained plot as crucial to the act of storytelling. So there's that really big key point there, is we really need that plot. Right. All right. Okay, good. So what's the big point of this paragraph? That plot is important, and Aristotle's the man. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, next paragraph here. The scholar Brian Richardson, in his essay, Beyond the Poetics of Plot, Alternative Forms of Narrative Progression and the Multiple Trajectories of Ulysses, offers his own definition of plot-based narrative, a teleological sequence of events linked by some principle of causation. That is, the events are bound together in a trajectory that typically leads to some form of resolution or convergence before pointing out that many narratives resist, elude, or reject plot. Oh, all right. So super long sentence here. Um, I think my biggest take home would be that we have another person here, Brian Richardson, who's basically saying, well, maybe you don't need a plot, or at least the plot that Aristotle is saying, um, saying that many narratives resist, elude, or reject plot. Right, and this is going against Aristotle yep. completely. Okay, so we don't know which way, you know, the author siding with these Marvel or these different comic movies, but essentially we have to understand that we're now discussing something totally different. Mm -hmm. We went from talking about novel, uh, these movies to how these movies can be sustained through narratives. Now, do we need plots or do we not need plots, right? That's kind of where the we're going with this. Yeah. So great job. So what what is uh you know Brian Richardson exactly saying? You kind of summarized it. Do we really need plots? Uh, doesn't sound like he's saying we do. No, we need some kind of causation, yeah. right? Some kind of sequence of events that lead to some kind of point, some kind of resolution or convergence. Some, so it, it, there's so essentially we don't need we do not need a plot. Right. We, you know, these, they resist or reject the plot. Yeah. Okay. And it's, it's interesting to try to bring in more uh, or less passive thinking as I, I, as I would read this, I'd go, well, sounds like Brian Richardson is basically just saying, well, if you think about our life, right, we don't live by a plot. We just have the kind of causations that are pushing us forward and we're, we're uh, going on this trajectory, which it sounds like he is saying. We can, exactly. we can have stories doing the same thing. Right. Okay. Especially in the 20th century, narratives began to remain insistently fragmentary, open-ended, contradictory, or defiantly plotless. 
Ooh, all right. So he's giving some examples of there are some narratives again in the 20th century that are plotless. There are, it turns out, many kinds of plotlessness. <laughs> um, so it sounds like the author is uh, coming here and saying, hey, we have uh, different examples of how these stories can be told without a plot. Right. Now, a lot of students are probably thinking, oh, man, what if I don't know what a plot is? Mm-hmm. Right. You don't need to. Yeah. As long as you knew that Aristotle thought plots are important for storytelling and that Richardson is bringing up the fact that maybe we don't need plots for storytelling, you're OK. You're going to be fine. Yeah. That's all. You don't need to worry about exactly what a plot is or understand how to tell a story. That's not that's not your business. You don't have to worry about it. Okay. Episodic storytelling as in Law and Order or The Simpsons, utilizes smaller, loosely connected narratives to allow for the maintenance of a comforting, predictable stasis overall. All right, so now we're giving some specific examples saying, hey, there's really uh, some plotlessness going on here. It's just loosely connected narratives and not, um, again, not really needing to know the definition of plot, but kind of trying to remember beginning, middle, end, which Aristotle laid out. in and, and some specific examples here of TV shows that yeah, do that. Yeah, excellent. You realize that, look, plots have middle beginning, middles, and ends, right? So this is saying it's loosely connected, probably does not have a beginning, middle, and an end, mm-hmm. right? So yeah, great job. You made this association to what a plot could be, okay. right? Without even, without really knowing what a plot is, you don't have to know. They educate you on this. They kind of bring in details on what they could, what you know, they describe plots in certain ways that you can pick up on and use to understand the rest of this passage. Hmm. Okay, extended novels such as Marcel Proust's *In Search of Lost Time* allow a single narrative to emerge out of non-linearity in an effort to produce a more accurate representation of thought, memory, and experience. Ooh, um, all right. So I, I think this is just. This sentence is super confusing, but I would read it and go, okay, this is just another example and I don't need to understand it completely. Yeah, well, I, I would understand the fact that it says emerge out of non-linearity. Okay. So yeah, that's another way of saying no plot, basically. Yep. Right, a plot is linear, right? Probably has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now you may be thinking, well, how did you know that linear is a plot and non-linear is not a plot? Yeah. Uh, well, you gotta op- keep your mind open. You gotta, you gotta embrace what you're reading. Understand that the author will describe it in many different ways. You have to pick up on those things. Yeah. And that comes with experience. That comes with practice and just a little bit of guidance, right? Like what I'm doing here, showing you that, look, try to figure out how they're describing these things because mm-hmm. they can describe these things again in different ways throughout the questions. So, you know, the, the, the question might say, oh, what does the author think about linear or nonlinear? And you may be thinking, well, I don't know. But if you associated it to a plot, then you should be fine. Yeah, and I think I, I keep coming back to this kind of uh, the way that the authors are writing is here's an idea, here are some examples. Here's an idea, here are some examples. And in this last paragraph, we have this sentence. It turns out many kind there, there are many kinds of plotlessness, right? And so one of one kind of plotlessness is the episodic storytelling law and order and symptoms uh simpsons and then this other kind is this non-linearity so yeah yeah exactly oh man all right so i i think it's a it's a kind of an interesting idea uh, if I were going to study for the mcat now i would try to always be on the lookout for this okay idea and examples, idea examples, and how that all backs up. Um, all right, so we're this paragraph is really um, countering the previous paragraph, right? So the previous paragraph, we have Aristotle saying, "Hey, you here are the ground rules for storytelling. It has to have a plot, a beginning, middle, and end." And then this next paragraph is, well, maybe not. I <laughs> mean, there are there are other ways to tell a story. Why, why do we bring up these things to begin with? Um, why, do we, why do we start the discussion on plots? Why do we start the discussion on narratives? Why did we discuss it? Uh, for this specific passage, it's because right. we started talking about how big this Marvel's universe is getting. 
Yeah, exactly. And how maybe do they need plots? Do they not need plots? Yeah. You know, what, how, what kind of storytelling do they have? Exactly. Great. Ooh, all, right. all right. So we have this question. Okay. To try to, to try to see if you really understood the passage. Let's go ahead and try it. You want to go ahead and read it and yeah. read the answer choices and then we can kind of figure it out. Okay. So the question is, what is the author's primary concern regarding the Marvel Cinematic Universe? A, that its movies can remain high quality entertainment experiences. B, that its owners have transformed the movie making business. C, that its approach to storytelling may not be sustainable long term. Or D, that its narrative does not adhere to traditional storytelling principles. Um, all right. So the primary concern. So we'd have to think about that language um, because some of these answers um, fit kind of what's being said, right? If I were to go, um, right, B, the owners have transformed the movie making business. Well, maybe, right, with so many movies uh, that that may be a fact, but it doesn't fit with the question of what's the primary concern. Um, and so I, I would go potentially if we're thinking about really all of the questions in this third paragraph, right? I, I think that's where the author's concern starts to come out. How flexible is a story? Can it really keep expanding? Uh, can it be extended indefinitely without becoming meaningless? And so uh, I, I am drawn towards answer choice C that the approach to storytelling may not be sustainable long term as the concern. Yeah, I mean that's really it, right? The whole the whole point of this is well, how can we tell these stories over and over again, right? How can we sustain these movies if if we're going to just keep bringing up new stories that kind of revolve around the same stuff? Yeah. So that is the concern, and that's exactly right. You brought up primary concern regarding the movies, and that is a concern that we have. So so let's cut it try to understand why A, B, and D are wrong yeah, and why, why C is the best. So A, that its movies can remain high quality entertainment experiences. I mean, we kind of said that early on, but that's not a concern, yeah, right? That's not a concern. Are they going to remain high quality? What kind of quality are we talking about? Are we talking about the narrative quality, the action quality, the, you know, the, the picture quality, like what kind of quality? It's not specific enough for us, but let's go ahead and read B. Uh, that its owners have transformed the movie making business. That's not we again, like you said, we didn't really bring up a concern about its owners transforming the movie, mm -hmm. right? The movie making business. Like it, it, we don't even discuss the movie making business. Yeah, if the author was like this type of repeated, uh, expanding blah 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 is is ruining uh, movie going, right? Then it's like, oh, okay, maybe that would fit. Right. And I mean, also B kind of suggests that the owners did something different to make the movie. Like, for instance, they only used one camera instead of 10 cameras mm -hmm. or they edited the movie in a certain way. That would be a just, you know, a reason to pick B. But we don't really discuss that. The whole point of this is, look, we have all these movies. How can we basically create more movies, more stories? Right. And then they go into discussing the different ways that stories can be told through plots and no plots. Yep. Uh, so C kind of fits that, right? Storytelling is not sustainable long-term. Uh, students may be confused with D, that its narrative does not adhere to traditional storytelling principles. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't really suggest that it got to be one way or another, right? Or one way, right? And not the other. It, it actually suggests both ways, right? It could have mm -hmm. plots or it can have no plots. So D is actually contradicting because D is suggesting that yeah, you know, it, it cannot adhere to traditional storytelling, but it has to adhere to non-traditional. It could adhere to traditional, right? Now, we do know the movies are leaning towards non-traditional paths, right? Mm -hmm. It says in the last paragraph that it's leaning towards or progressing towards this non-linear kind of no plot kind of way of, 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 of things. But that does not mean that you can't have traditional storytelling principles yeah so d in a way is out of scope it's just not relevant we don't like we talk about d we talk about um store traditional storytelling principles but we never suggest that the uh, this movie this marvel cinematic universe 
does not actually stick to those normal ways of, of doing the story. So mm-hmm. it, that's beyond the scope. It's also kind of contradicting because it's, it's suggesting that it's only one way and we don't really say it's only one way. We're, we're saying that, you know, they lean towards potentially nonlinear or no plots, but not necessarily always. That's the, some, not something we can always claim or suggest. Yeah. C is also better because it's speculative, right? It says it may not be sustainable. I rather pick something that's more speculative, that's more kind of general in a sense, than something that directly says, oh yeah, it does not adhere to traditional storytelling, because that seems a little bit more extreme than yeah. C. So yeah, so C would be the best answer here. Yeah, another another good kind of key take home for the MCAT is the extremes are typically not the right answer. Yes, and yeah, it, we, I talk about that a lot, but yeah, and usually if the passage is, on the neutral side, which it was, mm-hmm. you're not going to want to pick an extreme answer. Yeah. All right. So there is another episode in the books. Hopefully you followed along, you learned, you laughed, you cried, a little bit of everything. If you are looking for some more MCAT cars prep, go to jackweston.com and check out his course. Now his course is going to help you break down the passages, help you break down the questions. It's not something we do a ton here on the podcast, but his course is going to help you really break down the questions as well as the passages. If you would like a coupon to check out the course, go to medicalschoolhq.net slash Jack Weston, and that will activate a coupon for you to check out the course. And I get a little bit of beer money when you do that as well. Again, jackweston.com or medicalschoolhq.net slash Jack Weston. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time here on the MCAT Cars Podcast. This is MedEd Media.